Right, with all that done uh, and out of the way, what I'm going to do now is um, is we will start the, the formal talk, which is uh, the talk you can see on the screen. Uh, we have some in introductions first. So I'm going to pass you over to, um, to another one of our committee members uh, to talk, uh, to give the introduction, and then we'll move on to the, the talk. So thank you very much. OK. Thanks very much, uh, um, Simon. I'm Professor Chaba Sinka from the University of Leicester, and this is supposed to be in a good normal year. This uh, talk would uh, be taking place at the University of Leicester in the Department of Engineering. Uh, this year, however, uh, it is organized in this uh, uh, online format. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce my uh, colleague and very good friend, Professor Lyndon Smith from the University of uh, uh, West of England in Bristol. He's a professor of computer simulation and machine uh, vision. He has published three books, uh, written three books, uh, published more than that, uh, 200 papers, 12 patents, 20 students, PhD graduate, and so on. We can continue. Uh, but uh, uh, I've known Lyndon for more than 20 years, and I prepared a little surprise for him. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I'd like to pass the, uh, the, the stage uh, over to Lyndon. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Chaba. That's, uh, those memories of California are really great, actually. I hope you send me that picture. You know, I'd be really appreciate that. But this talk today is... Um, is on why you can't catch a rocket to Mars, some personal reflections on science and society, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So actually it accompanies this book, which I wrote a while ago, which I'll be talking a bit about. And um, I think I may as well just get straight into it to explain where I was coming from. So I've been teaching various courses over the years at UWE. And in fact, I used to teach a course on concurrent engineering. And uh, you know, I was talking about technology over the years, and I was said, to, and someone said to me, "Did I know that today is the day when Marty McFly comes back from the future?" And I said, "God, I didn't know that about this. You know, Back to the Future too. I've never seen it. You know, but apparently this date in 2015 was he, he gets come back to the future. So he was meant to be coming back from 2015 to 1985, and um, apparently in 2015 he was flying around on a hoverboard, and." Uh, and then uh, this looks like the cars were hovering around as well. And that, I guess that set me to wondering um, why we're not flying around on hoverboards. You know, why technology seems to have been not quite as dramatically progressing in recent years as we might have expected, really. Uh, especially in the last 50 years, I think. Because if you think about what happened up to 1969, with the things like the moon landing and the Concorde and so on, what's happened since then, I think you could say, has not been quite as dramatic. So that's what I was trying to think about when I, when I set me thinking at that time, and that's where the book and the presentation ultimately came from. So if we're thinking about what what's going to happen in the future, I think it's quite a good idea to think about what happened in the past. And um, what I like about what, what the engineers of the past is that they used to think big, really. The first ever Iron Bridge was at a place called, not surprisingly, Iron Bridge in Shropshire, and it was enormous. It was a great big affair over the River Severn. It wasn't just some little backwater that they put a bridge over. They put it over the, the Severn Gorge Valley, Severn Valley rather. And uh, again, with Brunel in Bristol, because I'm based in Bristol, I used to live across the, the bridge. I used to go across every day. Uh, really, I mean, even nowadays, I think nine, over 90% of the ironwork on Brunel's Clifton Suspension Bridge is original. And it hasn't required a great deal of work since he built it in the 1850s. So, you know, they really thought big in those days and they had they had inspiration and vision and aspirations as well, I think. And so the inspiration for the past, again in Bristol, because that's where I'm coming from, is um, of course for the, Con the Concord's a big inspiration, I think. Um, of course, it was built in Bristol and France. And this is its final flight. Someone got this lucky shot from a helicopter with the other brilliant uh, Bristol icon in the background of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. I mean, an aircraft that could cruise continuously at twice the speed of sound, and the only commercial airliner ever to be supersonic. So I wondered why we're not all flying around in supersonic planes now. And um, that got me thinking about this whole subject, I guess. But I think that's such a beautiful aircraft. I always tell the students 
well, the, you know, the most beautiful civil aircraft ever built, perhaps, I think. And of course, it's available to see now in Aerospace Bristol near Filton. Oh, OK, then. So this is me and Newton um, in the Science Museum. And what I was talking about in the book a lot is what science can do for us, because I'm a big fan of science and uh, especially of Newton, actually, as well, because I think that he's not as famous. I know he's famous amongst scientists and engineers, but in the general public's imagination, he's not as famous as perhaps he ought to be or could be. Maybe he's faded a little bit over the years. I don't know. But when you think about what he achieved with uh, mechanics and optics and gravity, it's astonishing, really. I mean, they're showing him in the science museum there with that prism because he realized splitting the light into the into the rainbow would enable you to um, determine the composition of stars, which I think is another amazing thing, really. So what we need then to make breakthroughs in science is new types of machines. And we need breakthroughs, I think, also in physics specifically. But I mean, I did a physics degree back in the dark ages, but it seems to me that in recent years, physics breakthroughs haven't been quite as dramatic as uh, we might have expected. And so why is that? Well, physics, of course, is a difficult subject. Was it um, someone who said uh, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you? Uh, I think someone said that, which is uh, probably, uh, you know, the, nature doesn't give up her secrets very easily. And I think there isn't that much enthusiasm really for science or hasn't been in the modern world as well, really. Um, and another theory of mine is that it's becoming a little dogmatic, maybe a preference for methodological reductionism, um, everything trying to break everything down to smaller elements all the time, which doesn't necessarily always seem to lead to the kind of fundamental understanding that we we hope for. And also, in my view, I mean, maths is obviously a critical subject in science and an absolutely necessary, powerful tool. But, you know, journal papers, I mean, Freeman Dyson said um, about his friend uh, Feynman that he thought Feynman was trying to find out what was going on with his papers rather than just, well, whereas Dyson was presenting, he thought he was presenting pretty maths. And I think there is a little bit of a tendency for that or fashion for that, and that um, there's a preference in journals for rigorous treatments even before the uh, relevant scientific arguments, I think, a little bit. I've got Poe there because he wrote about science in his book, The Purloined Letter, for example, quite interestingly. So um, we need some more breakthroughs. And what is, what's holding physics back? What's holding science back? Well, this might be controversial, maybe people don't agree with this, but environmentalism, perhaps, where it's not accompanied by a realization that uh, technology can actually solve problems for us in the, um, in, in, the, uh, in the ecological sphere. Political correctness I've got in there because anybody who tries to win grants nowadays probably knows what I'm talking about in terms of uh, there's an extreme emphasis on political correctness, so, which is a good thing if you're trying to help people and treat people fairly. But if we're moving away from reality in our political correctness, then this is not helping us make progress in science, I don't think. I've got down here an explosion in administration, of course, because that's everything that is very uh, an academic has to live with nowadays. And uh, the other point I've got down the bottom there is something which I'm quite interested in and um, having done lots of projects for companies over many years and developed systems that are actually working all around the world, I still notice the lack of collaboration and understanding between university research departments and companies and particularly in the UK. It's like a culture, a culture clash really. So that is something I'm also in a subject that's of interest to me. So what I've been trying to do in our centre in Bristol is get over the valley of death. I've been spending 20 odd years trying to get over the valley of death in various areas and various systems. And we've managed it to some extent. But you might say, what is the valley of death? Um, well, this is a picture of death valley in, uh, in the United States, Western United States, where the temperature, the highest ever recorded temperature was recorded at Furnace Creek, I think. But that's not the same as the valley of death. The valley of death, it's not to be confused with that, because the valley of death is getting from something working in a, um, in a demonstration to a working commercial system that you're going to exploit and sell. And this is such a challenge for academics. And uh, it's an interesting question about how we can get over this and how we can work with companies. Innovate UK, for example, is a good organisation that helps a lot. But if it was 10 times bigger, it would probably be more useful. You know, we need more of that kind of thing, I guess. Um, 
how can we help Britain to be more competitive and to get new products out and to get industry going? Well, there are various aspects to the problem of uh, what's holding back science and technology, I think. And another thing I talk about is schools and teaching. And uh, of course, I've got a lot of respect for teachers and uh, I've seen some great teachers over the years. But I've noticed looking at A-level syllabus in a lot of detail recently, which are physics in particular and maths. I don't know if it's um, becoming a little bit too much you know, away from applications and a little too much um, not really considering the real world in too much um, detail and too much coverage as well. It's like when I opened up a physics book, there were several chapters on uh, quarks. And I'm really, I don't know if that, area, you know, that might uh, disorientate people or think, well, is this going to be useful in their careers? Well, it turns out that physics and also maths, of course, are extremely useful subjects that are really, really useful in your career. Another thing I've got a bit of a problem with is multiple choice questions, because um, I think that's dumbing things down. And I could spend the next half hour talking about that, actually. But um, I go into that in the book in a little bit of detail. So really, then, what I'm talking about uh, a lot here is is the importance of being an engineer. And, uh, you know, my family, there's um, there's a, really a big tradition of engineers. And actually, my son's trying to train engineering as well at the moment at university. So, you know, it's a great uh, it's a great subject as far as I'm concerned. And I always think that Scotty from Star Trek is a great sort of a, a role model for engineering, taking it all seriously and with a lot of pride and about his engines and the ship and uh, he's taking, you know, it's all the, the engines of his babies and all this kind of stuff. Years ago, engineers really looked to the, looked to really be ambitious. The line that goes between London Temple Me, London um, Paddington and Bristol Temple Meads had a seven foot gauge, and that was in 1840s. And uh, if we kept the, set, the broad gauge, maybe we could have trains going at 200 miles an hour now without any problems or more. But nowadays, it's all about trying to keep the cost down and do things a little bit on the cheap, I suppose. So that's that's a little bit of a shame. But um, engineering is a great stuff. And I don't want to be controversial again, but I did go into this a little bit about whether um, about uh, whether a, a, a science technological uh, PhD is more valuable than a humanities PhD. And for me, at least from my subject point of view, yeah. And it is. And uh, for why Why is it? Well, as I got there, science can save your life. And I think with the uh, virus that's really uh, shocked us all recently, this is a good example of how useful science is. So I think that maybe people will understand generally in the public about how powerful and important science is with things like that going on. Science is objective, uh, whereas the arts are subjective. I, I, I mess around with paints, and this is a little um, painting I did of one of Constable's uh, um, paintings and uh, I, ca I can't prove that that has value that his painting has value or anything I've done ha has value but but it's just my subjective interest in it I guess um, and uh, science on the other hand I have a car which helps me go to work and buy the shopping which I need to survive so I've got down here at the bottom also by the way modern art <laughs> Okay, I had to put that in because uh, in the village I live in, in Wedmore, we've got the Turnip Prize, which is awarded every time, this time of year, every year. And it's like a parody of the Turnip Prize. So uh, that's something that's a little bit of local interest there. So uh, having spent a lot of time thinking about the problems we're facing, I was wondering you know, what the solutions are. Now, the trouble is with the solutions to a lot of the problems we face is that the, face, the problems are actually rather complicated. And uh, we've also got the black swan syndrome, where things come along completely unexpectedly. And the example being, for example, 9-11 uh, and coronavirus. And how do we deal with that? But um, a lot of the problems we face, although we can't always solve problems that are completely unexpected, but a lot of the problems we face, complex, difficult tasks that people undertake, can be solved through modelling and analysis. But the problems are so complicated, as it says there, that uh, a lot of the time the modelling has been considered to be unrealistic, maybe. But I think the breakthrough that I'd like to talk about today is really enabling us to make systems that can do these difficult, dirty, dangerous tasks that up to now people, men have been doing, is AI, artificial intelligence, neural networks, and particularly convolutional neural networks. So what are neural networks? Well, it's a pattern recognition technique, as it said there, driven by data. 
Now, it's inspired by the human brain and the neurons of the brain. It's obviously a vastly simplified version of anything like the human brain. But you have these, um, these hidden layers, which have neurons which have transfer functions. And the model is stored in the weights, which are like multipliers associated with each of these connections, links. So you have certain inputs going in, and then you get outputs coming out. So you've got the modeling going on in that way. I'm very interested in the uh, history, actually, of uh, neural networks. I tried to go into it in the book a little bit. Um, the guy who came up with it was um, Frank Rosenblatt, and there is a sketch I tried to do of him. And uh, he called it the perceptron. I think it's in, in, in you can see it in the uh, in Washington DC now, what he built in originally in the 56, I think it was. Uh, the mistake perhaps he made was to talk to the New York Times and to say that perceptrons will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce, and be conscious of their environment. I think he also said they'll be able to explore space, by the way. Uh, I think people realized after a while that they may know a little bit hubristic on his part, and that led to a little bit of a reaction. Along with the, I think that some people felt that it couldn't, you couldn't model nonlinearity, certain types of nonlinearity with it. it, led to it being more or less neglected until the 1980s. By the way, I, th I like the way this guy was a real, very, you know, all-round Renaissance man. I mean, he was a forward-thinking guy. I mean, he was actually had a background in psychology, I think, but he got into this uh, perceptron stuff. He had, a, he built an observatory to search for extraterrestrial intelligence in his backyard, on a hill behind his house, I think, actually. So that's the kind of thing I'd like to do. You know. Going back to uh, neural networks, so we feed in the inputs, they propagate through the network and produce outputs, as it says there. Now we compare the outputs to what we expect the outputs to be, and that's the error, of course. And then that's why it's called feed forward, because you've got that bit. And then the, pro the back propagation is where we try to modify the computer iteratively, tries to modify the weight so as to minimize the error. Hence, it's called a feed-forward backpropagation neural network, which sounds a bit complicated, but that's actually the simplest type of neural network, really. That, that's a that, that geometry there. Now, the interesting thing, the development that's occurred, I think, sort of since about 2012, is deep learning and particularly things like convolutional neural networks. So you might say, what's the difference between neural networks and uh, deep learning? Well. In deep learning, we're getting more neurons previous, than previously, generally speaking. Um, it requires a hell of a lot of computation, to be honest, but that's kind of handy because GPUs just come along being available for uh, gamers, so that's kind of convenient. Um, one thing they do uh, feature is automatic feature recognition, and that's something that's really handy and I'll talk about again in a bit. So that's your convolutional neural networks, and they're used for image analysis, typically. So. And they automatically, as it says, uh, we're identifying characteristics. Uh, I call these characteristics features. So it could be whatever is in the image that we're particularly interested in detecting. Now, what we used to do years ago was try to sort of handcraft these features. So go through trying to decide what we think they should look like and then searching for them in the image. But that's very laborious and turned out it didn't work too well either. But since the, as since the occurrence of deep learning and CNNs, um, We've been able to do this automatically, and the accuracy is also increased beyond um, for almost every day data type beyond pre, you know, previous methods, really. A chap who is uh, very famous in deep learning and uh, convolution neural networks is um, Jeffrey Hinton. So there's a quote for him. I think he's not that far off, actually, what, what's actually going to be happening with deep learning. There are thousands of applications, I'm sure. And um, so as it says there, it's taking its inspiration from the human brain. He had a student called Alex, and um, in a competition, I think it's in 2012, Alex Net was a network that his student rigged up, and it used, uh, it was basically a competition to see how, how accurately you could um, identify images from ImageNet, which is, a, which is an online database. And uh, I think he got the accuracy really improved quite a lot in the ImageNet challenge. And people realized something was happening in, 2012, they realized that this was a future and it really got going from then onwards. So he's a big figure in the history of it. We should also mention Jan Lacan, who was French but works in the United States. I think Jeffrey was English but works in Canada, by the way. And as we say here, AlexNet increased the uh, performance, the error went down to 15% from 26.2. Uh, Jan's big contribution was uh, the guy, I suppose, who invented convolutional neural networks, really. 
in 99, he came out with the system Lynette 5, uh, which was used to recognize handwriting on checks, on bank checks. And I think that he more or less used the same thing now. So he obviously did something pretty good there with that. And he's sort of considered to be the guy who invented them, really. He's still coming up with papers and still very active. So then what is convolution? Just I've been talking about convolutional neural networks, but maybe I'll have to go into a little bit of detail about what convolution is. So um, with convolution then, it's a very common image processing technique where we're changing the intensities of pixels depending on the, the intensities of, of the pixels around them, as it says there. So uh, when you use these packages like PaintShop Pro or Photoshop and so on, you're really using convolution, but usually they don't let you get into the maths behind it. But in machine vision, we, we sort of think about the maths behind it, I guess. So this is a common, this is an image that's been commonly used in 73. And uh, this, you can see the sort of softening of the image there. That might be created using something called a mean filter, which I think um, is explained in one of these slides here. But to achieve this uh, effect, we use um, something called a kernel, which is like a little grid, which is passed over the image iteratively. So this kernel could be of any size, really, but it just needs an odd number of, of um, rows and columns. Of course, that is because we need a central pixel that we're going to change the value of according to the processing. So the values in the kernel dictate what happens when we pass this across the image, whether it's um, trying to find edges, edge filtering, or soften the image, or use or anything else really that we're trying to do. But we're doing it one pixel at a time over the whole image, so a lot of computation. And obviously, the bigger the kernel and the bigger the image, the more computation. Now, this is a little image I use with the students, just showing how it works. So you multiply the, the value in the kernel by the corresponding value in the image, and then you can add them all together. In the case of the mean, you would just divide by the number of pixels that you've, that you've done the multiplication with. And that would, um, that would give you uh, an effect. I mean, in the case of the, the mean filter, the, you obviously, you get that softening effect, which can be a disadvantage sometimes in image processing, but it does have one advantage that you, you can reduce speckled noise. Any little bits of noise can generally be eliminated largely. I think they used it on the moonshot on Apollo 12 when they had a noisy image from the uh, from the moon. They were using mean filtering to clean the images up a bit. So given that that's what convolution basically is, it'd be good to think about how we use it in um, in a convolutional neural network. And, and uh, obviously this is a rather involved subject. So what I'll do is I thought I'd just give a very simple explanation with a very simple sort of uh, kernel and uh, image really. So imagine that we've got an image here which has got a curve in it. Now, if we wanted, um, we want to uh, think about a filter that, that uh, will detect that. And in this filter would have higher values in the general orientation area of the of the feature itself, in this case, the curve. So let's think about the, if we're looking at this simple image of a mouse. Now, um, if we start thinking about uh, the back of the mouse in this case, let's just go for this top left corner here, which is in this visualization. We're sort of putting the kernel on there. So we do a little multiplication. This is what the image looks like in terms of pixel values, and then this is our kernel. And then uh, we're just doing this multiplication thing again as before, and we're coming up with this value of six, a very large number. So we're getting a good match for the back of the mouse there. Now we start looking at the front of the mouse, and obviously these are the vet pixel values again, and uh, we're getting uh, a multiplication, but we're actually getting zero. So we're getting no kind of match with the front of the mouse. So basically that's because there wasn't anything, as it says there, in the image that responded to the curve detector filter. This is just a very simple sort of visualization or imagining of, of how, these, how these convolutions work. So we use them in the convolutional neural network then, the convolutional layer it creates an activation map or feature map, which is like an indication of how much that particular feature occurs at that point in the image, if you like. Now, um, that's just for one filter, but we need other filters because we're trying to get some, some general learning about the image. So we can use lines that curve to the left, or we can use, it says straight, straight edges there, 
and we use all sorts of different filters and we build up the activation map. So this could be a visualization of um, some of the um, filters convolving around the image and we're getting this kind of uh, these kind of outputs here. Now that was just um, we, we might start off with, with with simple curves and we go into more complicated um, uh, convolutions as we go. But one problem, of course, with all this is that we're generating a tremendous amount of data when we're doing this. I mean, we, if we had a just a, imagine we just had a small image, 32 by 32 pixels, and we just had a five by five filter. So we start in, processing the image with our kernel, and then we end up with this hidden layer here, which is obviously smaller than the actual input image. So we're mapping it to a 28 by 28 array. And then we build up uh, we build up layers in the core of the CNN. Each filter map, as it says, shows the detections of a specific type of feature, and we stack them, the activation maps for all the filters, along the depth dimensions, it says there. So that's sometimes you'll see them talking about 3D, uh, um, 3D um, activation maps with, um, with convolutional neural networks, but that's not to be confused with 3D uh, imaging, which is what we do in our lab a lot of, actually getting range data and so on. It's just the way that the convolutional neural network is where it operates. So then, um, to give the general structure of a CNN, just because uh, we may as well be, be try to be complete, uh, so we've got the convolutional layers then that they process the image with. Then we have a layer to remove negative values that helps with the training, ReLU layer it's called. So that just gets rid of the negative values. Then we have pooling layers, which I won't go into the detail of how they work here, but they basically reduce the data for us. And then, um, otherwise it'd be completely unmanageable. And then we have fully connected layers at the back, which are for classification. So they're a bit like the neural network I talked about originally, in that they classify things according, because with connected weights in a fully connected way. So that's basically the overall sort of schematic of, of how a, a CNN is, of, is, is arranged. But uh, so I, went, I had to go into a little bit of detail there about how they operate. I thought it would be useful. But um, what's really interesting is what we can do with these, these, these type architectures. And we can, as I say, we can identify features of interest in complicated sets of images quite amazingly well, I would say, compared to other techniques. And by doing that, we can solve complex problems that are previously because they're too difficult by a lot of people. I mean, for example, years ago, people used to think that a neural network, back in the 80s, when neural networks took off, they thought that a, a, a neural network could be used to recognize a pencil. But it turned out it could only really be used to recognize a pencil if the pencil was presented to the neural network in the same way. But with this technology, we can present the, net, the, the, the pencil to the network in all sorts of orientations, different lighting, different conditions, and it'll still recognize the pencil. So it's more powerful. So it's doing, I think, you could argue, in terms of recognition, of, of automatic recognition, what people thought neural networks could do years ago. It's now do, actually doing it now. So it's working out um, in this image, as you can see, what, um, what we got in the image reasonably accurately. This is a sketch here. Now, as I say, that means we, we can avoid a lot of, um, of the labor that used to be involved with this handcrafting of features of dogs, for example. And, uh, and that's one advantage. Another advantage, as it says there, is we don't, you know, because the computer itself generates the idea of what a dog looks like, it's more accurate than our sort of idea of a, an idealized dog that we might try and use in template matching or something that we would have done before. So it's more reliable. You know, neural networks have got a big advantage over sort of equations and fit, curve fitting and so on generally, and that we don't assume that relationships have a particular form. We don't assume it's an exponential or it's a quadratic. We just use the data and model it directly, and we do the, the modeling on a data-driven way. And that really makes it more powerful, I think, in a pres more prescriptive approach. Uh, yeah, and also it works if there's a lot of noise in the data or there's a lot of variations, it says there. Shadows, changes in light levels, we can accommodate that with CNNs, really. Now, one example of what we did in the lab, and we've done a lot of all sorts of different things with um, CNNs, but one advantage that I presented in the paper was that we were detecting dockweed for, for a farmer in Scotland, actually, uh, in, in grass. Now, if this was dock in, you know, a weed in dirt, it would be quite straightforward, you'd use colour. 
but this is a more challenging problem because we're just looking at a bit of dockweed and some grass. So if we're looking at busy images. We could be looking at very small amounts of dock. And, um, and it works remarkably well. We were able to detect down to just 5% dock, which is hard, quite hard for a human to see in an image, actually. And we were able to detect that. And then the idea is you squirt a little bit of weed killer directly at the weed, rather than spraying it everywhere like they do at the moment. Because in the near future, they're going to stop uh, people from spraying weed killer everywhere because it's bad for the environment. Of course, it'll save money as well just to be able to shoot it directly at it. So this is the sort of technology everybody's going to be using quite soon. Some techniques that we talked about in the paper I presented on this are transfer learning and data augmentation. I'm not sure I can go into the details of how these work right now, but basically there are powerful techniques that enable us to get good reliability in detecting things like dark weeding grass, even when we've only got a small amount of data. Basically, just in a nutshell, transfer learning is where you use a, a network which has been trained by a previous, a previous uh, uh, using a previous net, uh, set of images, and then you just sort of tune it for the weeds. And data augmentation is just where you add to your database of weeds by using, changing, the, flipping the image, zooming in. You wouldn't think these kind of things work, but they do work quite well and give you improved accuracy for the neural network. And we can detect uh, up to 90 odd, uh, 95 or above 95 percent accuracy with this, up towards 100. So that was just going into a little bit talking there about what we can do with CNNs, but uh, talking about how we can make progress generally, uh, I think taking a systems based long term approach and thinking big, as it says there, is the way to go on these things. So we're looking for novel and advanced capabilities. Uh, a lot of the time we've got difficult problems with challenging requirements, but we can use CNNs to model the complicated situation and get data we need to get the solutions. And uh, all sorts of things could be done in all sorts of different ways. For example, I've got a little picture of a drone there delivering a parcel. This is quite uh, an interesting area. I think Amazon are very keen on this. And um, the cost, the last mile is where half of the delivery cost is involved, apparently. So if you can use CNNs to monitor the environment, GPS isn't so useful, especially in a built-up area, the last, last little distance. But you can use CNNs to interpret the environment. Then you can tell the drone where to go even in complicated situations where things are changing. You know, thinking about um, what we can do with AI in general, got me thinking, I mentioned this in the book, about a project, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's um, there was a program, IBM Watson was a computer in the States, which went on, the, on TV over there and uh, did very well at the Jeopardy uh, pro, um, quiz. And people got very excited and uh, IBM put $62 million into developing this from then, 2013 to 2017, to help with diagnosis of certain types of cancer. And they also spent billions on acquisitions of companies to help with this as well. But by 2017, the project was put on hold, as it says, after costs went beyond $62 million, without the system being used on a single patient. Why did it work on Jeopardy, but not on the real application? This is something I go into in the book. And it, there are lots of reasons to, to do with this. But um, one reason is interesting is that games are fairly simple with a set of rules and very constrained. Even the general knowledge quiz that we have on that show is, is just looking at lots of data, which can be available in databases. But what's going on when you're looking at patient records for cancer and that kind of thing, is that you're looking at data which is presented in ways which are generally non-standard and vary in terms of presentation and nomenclature. And this makes it very difficult for the computer to handle it. So I think my what I was saying, my theory on this was that it'd be good if we could establish some kind of standardization for metadata for these kind of applications. I mean, this so we get more objective data presented in a more standard way, which computers like this could use more for guiding treatments in healthcare. I mean, already to some extent this is appreciated in medicine because you know, uh, blind trials, 50-50 trials, where they randomly select people uh, to, to give the treatments to are attempts to get the data more objective. But I think the way the data is presented is also critical as to whether you can get a really useful outcome from um, from these systems. This was used in Asia quite a bit, actually, for, for to help sort of um, with doctors to, to give them more confidence in their deductions. But it wasn't working in the way that IBM hoped it would, really. And just talking about something that we've got experience on the last 18, 19 years in the lab, we developed this thing called a skin analyzer, which measures moles in 3D 
and recovers the texture from the top of the mold, 3D texture. As far as we know, it's unique in the world in doing this. And what I'd really like to do, we used it with a thousand patients and found that the more irregularity there is in the mold, the more chances it might be in cancer. We've got about uh, four or five PhDs and 20 odd papers out of it. But getting it from, again, it's the value of death, because getting it from a research device into a medical device to use a diagnostics and used for patient, you know, informing patient uh, treatment is difficult. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is get uh, CNNs working with the data from this. I think that would give us an, an ability to do automatic diagnostics, actually. But again, it's finding the time and the money to, uh, to go and do it. But that's one that's particularly keen. I'm particularly keen on the skin analyzer. I know it's a little bit too bulky. We, we miniaturized it in the next version, actually. It's a big subject. I could go on about this all day, actually. But it's, it's an interesting one for me. So then, talking about deep learning, I've got the godfathers of deep learning. But, um, now, the reason why I put them up there is because they are actually called the godfathers of deep learning, these guys. Um, Jeffrey Hinton, Jan Lekan. I should also mention Yosha Benio, Benio, who has a lab and has done a lot of work in deep learning. So he's really got to be mentioned up there as amongst the, the godfathers. And all this talk of godfathers, of course, made me think of the godfather. So I put a sketch in of Marlon Brando as the godfather. And, uh, and uh, I thought that was quite amusing. But, uh, yeah, a few references to the film and so on, if anybody's particularly into that, but um, yeah. So other things we're talking about in the in the book, um, can computers be used to more effectively direct technological development? Uh, this is interesting. Can deep learning be used to help us with technological development? I think it, there's so much data flying around in materials labs. In, I used to work in a materials lab for quite a few years. And there's so much experimental data uh, that it's not really be used that much at the moment. And if you could use it in the deep learning, you might be able to um, help with design. And uh, years ago, I tried to get into this, but the techniques I was using back in the 90s were not really AI, not in the same way that um, CNNs are, because the CNNs do simulate the way the human humans uh, can tackle problems quite well. Or can computers even be used to significantly increase our scientific understanding? I tried to discuss this in, in the book a little bit, um, more of a challenging sort of philosophical slightly problem about how we, it might help in the design of experiments for um, progressing science. And then I've got a little bit on the nuts and bolts of a rocket to Mars, talking about things like uh, mass accelerators, which I think if you want to go to Mars, I mean, we could do it with, with Elon Musk's um, ideas with SpaceX, it's possible, but the way to get there in a more economic way would be to have something like a mass accelerator accelerating a lot of equipment up into orbit and then launching from orbit, which is something I talk about. And then they're also going to a little bit on potential indefinite threats and possible responses. I can't really go into this now, but um, these are quite topical, I think, these, these particular threats. Um, I'm not sure Brexit is a threat, but for political reasons, maybe people have thought it was. But uh, talking about different things that, of course, viruses being very topical and global warming as well. Now, talking about the future, it's easy to talk about the past, but talking about the future is a little more challenging. And uh, I do talk about there what, you know, the situation since 1969 and the situation before 69 as well in some detail. And uh, the present and near future is more easy to predict than, of course, the far future. That's the, of course, um, the inventor of the internet, really, or at least they sent, yes, rigged up the first website. And uh, from CERN in 1991, I think it was. This, since this is a materials uh, organization, I thought I'd better go into materials a little bit. And this is from the book as well. But um, something that's going on at the moment is bio mimetics, which is where you you take you take constraints of a problem, you constrain it in a CAD system, computer aided design, and then you do iterations to optimize the strength to weight ratio for a particular application. You end up with something that looks remarkably like a like a biological structure, like a vine or parts of an animal or something, which is kind of interesting. I thought the interesting part here is that um, I was talking to the students quite a lot about this, but the complexity of the 3D curves is what's going to limit this. What we can actually design on the CAD system will limit this, because if we do something like rapid manufacturing uh, to manufacture it, we could probably produce anything. It's just a case of can we model it before we manufacture it? We can design and manufacture it. Can we actually model it? Talking about rapid manufacture, got me into this idea of a replicator. And uh, can we build things up at the atomic or molecular level? And uh, so currently in IP, we, we, we'd be lucky to get to the micron level, 
really. But to do something like a replicator, something that could produce an engine, a motor and a car with all the complexity of that built in it, we need to manipulate things at an atomic level or molecular level. This is um, talking about rapid manufacturing. This is a machine which is available in Filton. Our GK are using it in Filton. I think it's a Swedish machine, this one. And um, it does produce parts from solid titanium, I believe, at uh, pretty much full density. And so it's possible to build these parts up, but the materials are somewhat limited. Because I did some research on this years ago when we did some papers. And we, looked at, we were looking at trying to make aluminium parts for aerospace, which is very topical and a hot subject. But it's, of course, aluminium powder is explosive, and it's a bit of a difficult, from oxidation point of view. But um, this is an exciting area, uh, because the aircraft obviously got thousands of parts, all different designs, and all the jigs and tooling is expensive. And if you could make them in this way, you could potentially save a lot of money, really. But the replicator on the atomic level is something else. So uh, this whole presentation and book could have been talking about nothing other than nanotechnology, because uh, really this many of the things I'm talking about apply to nanotechnology in quite a strong way. Richard Feynman gave a talk, Plenty of Room at the Bottom, uh, where he talked about uh, the, producing very small machines to do tasks. And then the term nanotechnology was coined in 74. I don't know if you've heard of, um, this gives me some idea of, the, of what we're talking about dimensional wise, but Eric Drexler wrote a book in 95, 96, 86, Engines of Creation, the Coming Area of Nanotechnology. That's a sketch I did on him there. Um, now, not the nanotechnology has got, I just put a note in here that it's not like nanotechnology has not produced anything. There's been a lot of developments in nanotechnology, like invisible glass, which uses uh, small short needles to make the glass effectively invisible. But what he had in, had in mind, Drexler, was rather different. In this book, he was talking about fabrication of molecular machines and um, from molecular builder blocks. So he had the idea of these machines being self-replicating. Now, uh, these nanobots, as he called them, could spread and, and form into a grey corpus, according to him. So this grey goo was, was uh, quite a scary idea of something that could uh, exist on a large scale and, uh, get, and uh, be quite a threat, actually. And so the reason I mention this is this is very, very influential. It might seem like a fantastic idea, but it was very, very influential in, in science and especially science fiction, actually, but in, in also in science as well, this idea of um, uh, this... Um, these tiny nanobots and the grey goo. Thank God this grey goo is not happening, that's all I can say. But um, why hasn't all this happened? Why hasn't there been a huge breakthrough? Because years ago, there was such a, so much emphasis on nanotechnology. Why hasn't there been this huge breakthrough? Well, I think it's because we don't have that great an understanding of the physics at the molecular level. Uh, things like energy considerations, uh, Brownian motions, it says there, surface energy. These are quite critical at that scale, of course, or at a very small scale. So until we get this kind of physics understanding of what's going on this scale, it'd be hard to build tools or, or machines on this level that you need to produce something like a nanobot. So I think there's a long way to go in something like nanotechnology. It's another case of the, of the, the hype kind of overtaking the technology and, the, and what was actually going on and leading to a little bit of a reaction, I think, really. But I'm not saying it couldn't have a great future because if we could start getting a, le a replicator up together to manipulate on the atomic scale, then we could make almost anything and all sorts of manufacturing, all sorts of different scales and complexities would be possible with a whole multitude of example of advantages for the future, all sorts of fantastic possibilities. One thing you could do with um, nanotechnology, which I mentioned in the book, is, is the idea of microscopic hyperfilaments, which Arthur C. Clarke talked about in his book, The Fountains of Paradise, actually, which is kind of an interesting book. And so if you want to build a, spe a space elevator, you need something like this. A space elevator is, is basically a tether which goes from the Earth up into geostationary orbit at 20,000 miles, 22,000 miles up. Um, you couldn't build it with conventional materials at the moment on the Earth. You could build one on the Moon, and you could build one on Mars, Kevlar or whatever. But you need something a bit stronger for the Earth at the moment. So this might be where nanotechnology shines in getting these hyperfilaments. Once you've built this tether, you could just take anything you want up the tether, and by the time it gets to the top of the tether, it will be in orbit, in geostationary orbit. So you'd save a tremendous amount of energy once you built this thing. You wouldn't have to use rockets to launch things. So that's my little take on, on some of the situations with nanotechnology. 
So then thinking about the far future, which is what I try and do a little bit as well, that's even more difficult, of course. Transport, what we could do, the idea of a lightweight power source, I think is critical to get a lot of this working. Robotics, all sorts of possibilities are, 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 are hopefully will occur and could occur. A lot of the, there's a strong case I, I make in the book for the Android being a, a good way to go, because for many, many reasons, a robot that resembles a human could have a lot of benefits in the future, in the far future. Talking about the very distant future is even more difficult, and probably nobody with it, so wise men would advise against it. You know, um, but these are some of the topics I tried to get some kind of handle on. Um, the elimination of instrumentalities, uh, brainwaves, using brainwaves for controlling things. Interesting subject. Time travel, even more interesting. I think we'll find we'll be able to go into the future, but I don't see us ever going into the past. Uh, power, power sources, like with power sources, a good one. The material thing we've been talking about a minute ago. Miscellaneous miracles, such as um, visibility, uh, uh, eternal life. These are quite interesting subjects, but to say when they will occur is a little more tricky. So I don't, when I talk about this in the book, I'm not saying that, I'm just putting it in for to stimulate conversation. Well, I can't guarantee a timescale on this stuff. The effects it will have on our society and putting it all together, the destiny of mankind. Man's future in the stars, and uh, that's something I talk about. And then summary of predicted far future technological developments. Just an estimate, really. As I say, man's future in the stars, it's, I think Shakespeare said it's not in the stars to hold our destiny, but in ourselves, which he meant, I suppose, we can't read in the stars what our destiny will be, or get in, you know, information on our destiny for that. But, but our long-term destiny in mankind might be, hopefully, to travel to the stars. I talk quite a lot in the book about what possibilities there might be for interstellar travel for that. Because there are all these threats that, depending on how serious they are on the Earth, I guess, the ultimate solution for them is to mankind to, to get out into the stars and colonise a little bit. So by way of concluding remarks then, I put a little quote in from Stephen Hawking. Remember to look up at the stars and not down your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. Be curious. And however difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. It matters that you just don't give up. I, I kind of like that uh, very positive quote from uh, Stephen Hawking. And there is a picture of him, a sketch I did, on the set of Star Trek The Next Generation. So he's with Albert Einstein. He's in good company. Isaac Newton and the android data. And... Apparently, when he was on a tour of the set, he saw the warp core in engineering said, I'm working on that. And to this day, apparently, Stephen Hawking is the only person to play himself in an episode of Star Trek, which I thought was kind of kind of interesting. So that's uh, that's the end of the conclusion. That's the end of my little talk. I've got the book, I have a little plug for the book at the end here. It's on Amazon. So um, if anybody you know, wants to learn more, uh, it's all in there. So. Uh, that's the end of my talk, and I guess if there's any questions, I could take you for some questions. If, um...